screen share. Let's see. Ooh, let's see all. Okay. There we go. Does that work? Can you all see this? I don't know how to check it uh, out. Not yet. Can't see it yet. Oh, damn it. Okay, yeah. Is this, does that work? Share. Yeah, perfect. That's right. All right. Okay, please ignore the, the things at the bottom. This was to get um, university students to care about judging, which they don't in this country. Um, so, yes. So, basically, I'm just going to first talk about what you want to, what you should expect from this lecture, um, what to look forward to in the upcoming lectures and what the scope of this is. Um, and then subsequently, how I will integrate um, the, like the, I will talk about the videos in part when I'm talking about the lecture, but this is more like a general, how to like basically get yourself set up for further like understanding of judging. So it's not meant to supplement everything you're supposed to know. It's meant to give you a framework. Um, and the third thing is if I speak too fast, which is kind of my thing, Somebody just stop me because, you know, um, understanding is important for knowledge. Okay, cool. So, oh no, how do you, oh, there we go. So, this is what I'm going to do today. The first is I have some general housekeeping thoughts, you know, just like as a matter of when you enter the room um, as a judge, I mean, this applies to all tournaments, not just BP, um, what you should like immediately be aware of. Then I'll talk about the type of motions. Um, people encounter general mistakes people make. Obviously, I'm talking with the POV of a judge. So when you're judging these things, look out for these mistakes that people make in terms of the motion. Um, third is tracking the debate. Um, the point I have with regards to tracking the debate is not a, a, like a comment on writing always or anything. It is just a matter of most of your work can be done just by having properly thought out notes because I think once you figure out where you are in the debate you're not lost um, and you like track things okay, I'll talk about this later well, my point is tracking debate is half the job uh, you get that right you're probably in a good shape for like panel discussions um, the fourth is basic and direct comparisons so just like I think by and large debates um, have direct clashes in terms of like rebuttal engagement nuance and I think people need to learn how to do that I mean this applies to all debating because you can't judge direct comparisons you're a bit screwed for BP but so we'll fix that first um, and then I'll talk about back half expectations what makes good extensions what makes a meaningful extension how what's the standard for meaningful as opposed to just a value add that is like not really important. Um, I'll kind of talk about the debate that, I, that, we, that we gave you all, but I think that's a good, exp like, a good example of one extension that was just like, what's going on? The other extension was like, ah, something there, you know? Like, so I think it's a good contrast. Um, and then I'll talk about judging diagonals. So in cases where people don't get respond to each other, what happens when cases are like, like exclusively apart, how to judge them. Um, and then I'll talk about the speaker scale because people judge really weirdly. Um, and we should roughly think about the way we score people, not just vibe check ourselves and, you know, that's the score people get. All right, cool. General housekeeping thoughts. Woohoo, basics. Okay. Um, so just some basics I think people need to know. The first is the fiat. Um, I know this has like been drilled into everyone's head, like through like since the beginning of time. But when you are judging, you have to make it abundantly clear that you have taken into consideration that there is a fiat that the GAF teams can propose in the debate. I think most judges know this, like to the degree that something can be assumed or the motion states um, that an action can be done. So for example, like banning abortion, even if like, the, like you know, it is hypothetically true that, you know, very hard to get into legislation that is irrelevant in the debate. The point I want to make here that I think is equally important is I think opposition also gets some fiat in the debate in terms of how much resources they can use to carry out their things that are counterprop. So it is very unfair in the debate for you to allow the gov to carry out their model, but similar and fair um, counterprops or like things that they suggest they can do on the opposition, you disallow. The very common example that I use when I teach people to judge is this house would ban cigarettes, for example, and the GAF team proposes a com comprehensive ban in terms of like legislation and like enforcement. And the op says, we won't ban it, but we will use some resources to do things like extend um, education so people can make meaningful choices. That is like something op teams are allowed to do. Obviously, there is a matter of discretion in terms of how much of the resources you are willing to allow both teams, but just make it like clear in your head don't allow one team to say like their policy by extension is like this huge thing and op has literally nothing to do that's a bit unfair to them the second thing i want to note is the average intelligent voter so all right i want to make it very clear this doesn't mean you know nothing it doesn't mean you're sitting in the room being like if the person says osama bin laden lives in malaysia and is having nasi lemak every day you're like absolutely right 
congratulations opening government like that's not how the, how the logic works yeah you are roughly aware of the way the world looks like you know roughly what's happening in politics you open the paper once in a while you know like you roughly know trump is alive being like rude and racist you know you're not you're not completely oblivious of those things but the most important part of this is that you're willing to be persuaded and obviously i think this works against things like your intuitions and i re- so like the the way i approach this when i'm judging is not to pretend like i don't have an intuition because obviously i have things like political opinions and like positions i believe in to be true just when people present to me arguments that i think i opposition to them i ask myself if the logic and the reasoning for their arguments stands independently and if i am discrediting it because i am of this particular position so check yourself against your own intuition like don't pretend like it doesn't exist and then treat all arguments as if you're you know you are able to like like be this objective reasonable third party person um i think checking yourself is obviously very important um right the part about being non interventionist i think it's a caveat which is obviously i think you don't want to make arguments for teams and complete comparisons and extrapolate benefits that you think are like you know intuitive but that doesn't mean to say that you don't intervene like with the bare minimum of like <laughs> some things need to be logically stepped out and i can make like some conclusions that are reasonable but not beyond what is like reasonably inferred from teams i know i'm saying what is reasonable a lot and it means it's very much a matter of discretion but um that's why you're a judge people trust you to use your like reasons um just ask yourself if it is indeed stepping to the bounds of i'm completing arguments and like comparisons versus i am like reasonably interpreting what is already been presented cool um lastly is just because you are an average reasonable person doesn't mean you're incapable of understanding complex and complicated thoughts like obviously it's up to teams and like i like i know you like judging is like obviously like you appreciate clarity um but it does not mean that even argument gets unnecessarily complex it's not on you to try to understand it if people are muddled up and like it always happens in econs debate that they don't make links and they throw out like big words you also should check for that to make sure that you're not unnecessarily crediting arguments just because they sound complex so just check for these things as you are judging just be aware that this is how you approach being a reasonable and like intelligent voter cool The last things I want last thing I want to note when you're judging and like I don't know I guess it's a pet peeve because I do this a lot on the oppositions is opposition teams don't have to provide you a solution okay they can if they want to they can have a counter prop and they can be like here are some benefits more counter prop compared to the benefits and the harms of yours they can equally say we have no solution our position this debate is your model makes status quo worse i mean if they prove it is marginal and the gaf team proves that the marginal harms are like outweighed by the benefits gaf can still win and obviously ops have to prove a like a measurable difference in the harm and negate the benefits but it's not to say that they have the burden to provide a solution don't artificially place it on teams like nobody is asking you to do that please don't do it you will get teams pissed off i've given so many ones to judges who have done this so just make sure you're not artificially placing burdens on these people i mean these are the three things i think are most important before you enter into a debate um so yeah that is general housekeeping and thoughts i have about housekeeping any questions before i go on to the next part about motions okay you can type your questions later also no problem cool motions um the reason i'm going through motions um is obviously to get you like a refresher on like don't mix up motions but also because when you judge even if teams like so obviously you're supposed to judge the debate as it happens but if some team misreads the motion and their arguments don't apply because the motion is so different as i'll explain later it is on you to realize that the motion is not what they are debating um and to take that into account so largely there are three kinds of motions there are policy motions there are analysis motions and there are actor motions i mean analysis motions are also value judgment motions you can call it whatever you want to it's the same thing cool policy this is obviously the most straightforward it is just you would do an action um and you assume the house is the parliament um and you're debating whether or not it is a good thing and you would enact this policy the debate is about whether or not a specific policy should be passed obviously that includes things like the fee and we spoke about it's pretty obvious and um you would have to provide like a model of how this would work because it is actually like a piece of legislation um this is a policy debate I'm, i'm like i i don't think people have problems with this because it is pretty straightforward um so i'm going to move over that faster the things that are more important so um analysis motion so the first one is like kind of like this house believes that this house supports um this house opposes obviously these debates don't require you 
to have a model in, this, in the traditional sense that we speak about, it still requires you to set standards for which you should judge the debate. Yeah. So when you are a judge and you are judging the debate, there's, oh, there's one thing to judge the arguments that are in play and people's weighing of them. It's another thing you must also incorporate is what teams say the standard is for judging this round. It could be like greater in like, in like protection of rights or it could be who better like enables minority protection and like representation. But my point is teams will say standards for whether or not we think X thing has done more harm than good or why we support like a specific thing. You have to look for those mechanisms. I think those standards are as important as the way the arguments played out. Because it could be very true that teams can win specific arguments. But if you are unpersuaded because of the debate, that that is the metric to judge the debate, that should be taken into account. Most importantly, this debate is not a ban debate. It is not a policy debate. So it's not on teams to have a policy. If any one of the opposition says, how are you going to do this? How are you going to get rid of protests? They exist everywhere. Are you going to clamp down on people? Are you going to put them in jail? Jail has so many harms and they go off this tangent of a jail. Um, just take a step back and be like, what even are you talking about? Because this motion is a value assessment of the thing that we are doing from a third party, like a neutral observer. Um, and when you're judging, make sure you are very, very aware of that as to not let the debate spiral into ob the oblivion that is nonsense. Okay, cool. The next one, this house prefers, um, I mean, it's just like, so the motion says this house prefers a world in which no one would lie. The example that I put, um, it is just a question of whether or not we think this statement is a true and correct and a good one. Um, and the gov will give reasons for why they think it's good and preferable and the opposition has to defend the status quo. You cannot create a new world. For the love of God, I heard, I, a lot of teams do this where they're like, oh, we don't prefer X thing, but in our new world, there will be no racism, there will be flowers everywhere and everybody will be miming like I am now. It's just like, you can't invent a hypothetical. You have to compare it to the status quo as it is. Obviously, you know, in like the Gov team, when they are explaining um, their, 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 their position on this, when they say they prefer a world where no one can lie, their fear is that they can prefer that world where in which that thing is true, which is no one can lie. They can't fear all the outcomes or consequences of the way the world looks like. That's up for debate. So don't allow the scope of the fear to go beyond what is allowed by the motion. Make sure you take that into account when you judge um, prefers motion. Cool. The next one is... Um, yeah, I mean, okay. The next one is this house prefers X over Y. Like this is just like a, we would prefer dogs over cats. That's a motion. And so I like, I know a lot of teams do this on the opposition. I mean, the dogs and the cats, what is not a very good example because I can't do it. But like this house prefers yellow over blue. And then the optimists would be like, we prefer the middle. It is green. That's the combination of the colors, right? Yeah. So my point is, Obviously, like op teams will try to do, we prefer it somewhere in the middle, which is like, I guess you can like, I mean, my point is that's wrong. That's the first thing I want to make. You can't let teams make random comparisons. If it's X over Y, opposition team picks Y over X. That's just how the debate world looks like. Um, so when you're judging, make sure that that is the burden teams fulfill. If they don't, it will become a weird debate. And obviously like, that's not what teams are supposed to do. Make sure you don't impose such a thing on teams. Like, don't tell, don't give in feedback teams the ability to be like, you should have picked the middle ground. That's that's the correct op case. Go really soft and then figure out what you're going to do. Bad. Don't do that. Okay. Last one. Is it the last one? No, it's not the last one. So this one is um the regret motion. I mean, this is like the most common version of the analysis motion that is it like like debated, which is you just regret the thing that ex existed. Um, so obviously it means that we have the benefit of hindsight. It, like it, obviously we are regretting something that has happened in the past or is currently happening. And you would have all the arguments as to how it has functioned thus far. And that would apply to this debate. More importantly, it is an argument of whether or not the world would be better if we removed that thing from existence. And obviously, it's a matter of debate how that world would look like, what changes in terms of incentives, what changes in terms of the landscape, in terms of like every single argument, because obviously when things don't exist, the world is different. Um, this means that the GAF teams have to explain why this alternate reality that they are speaking about, um, it will be obviously like, you know, better off for these individuals. Um, the last... Okay, that's just an example from another debate. So ignore the last line on this slide. But the point I'm making is just that obviously in like this house regrets motions, you want to make sure that um, the comparison is an alternate world versus like the status quo. Opposition teams talk about the status quo and explain why it's better. Cool. Now, this one is, I mean, it exists. Um, but obviously, like I think this one is 
uh, very close to the actor motion. So just pay attention to this when you're judging. And if the actor motions only have one comment, which is like this house as X, or if the motion is this house believes it is in the interest of X, that is not like, that is obviously from the, like the interest of that particular actor. Um, but motions like this, where there is an actor in it, but it's not a, an actor motion, are obviously things you take from a perspective of a neutral person, whether or not it's a general good thing for this actor to do this. Obviously you can take into account the POV of this actor insofar as we care about it from a third, but like a neutral observer, but just make it very clear that it's not an actor motion when you're judging, don't treat them the same. Cool, actor motions, like um, the most obvious thing I have to say here is that this debate is obviously from the perspective of that actor. When you are judging this debate, you have to take in that, obviously take in all the arguments from the perspective of the actor. Now, what is the incentives of this actor? What values does this actor have? Does this actor care about general moral values? Does he have a specific moral value? Does he care about like, specific incentives that might be like, like morally frowned upon in other ways is a matter of debate and teams will often spend a lot of time explaining to you what incentives of an actor they weigh up and put that incentives in a hierarchy so look out for that when you're judging and most importantly um it is also not true that this debate precludes principles like i think it is very important to acknowledge that actors have principles it is possible that people can make general principles and say the actor cares about those general principles but the point i'm making is just that it is not without um, um, value in the debate it can win debates obviously depends on how well it is done similarly with like practical concerns an actor might have so don't preclude these things when you are judging just because you think that it is not relevant in this type of motion. There's no reason to think that, so don't do it. Cool. Um, yes, track in the debate, fun stuff. Um, so, the, so, like, I mean, people have different thoughts on this. Some people track every single word that happens and has a separate paper to like transfer important stuff. Some people just wait for the argument or the way like they know stuff is important, so they track those things down. Um, however your way may be, you wanna make sure when you are tracking, you are like, like actively tracking what you need to track does it make sense so for example the first thing you, like i always track um, is the evolution of arguments so things start out very differently at the beginning of like prime minister from the way they end up becoming defended in the deputy prime minister the way they are caveated against things against the opposition what their new concerns are whether or not those incentives are the same what the comparative incentives so when you are tracking the evolution of an argument it is important to track it in the way it has manifested in the debate, not the way it has begun in the debate. Um, and obviously that's just because you judge debates as a whole and by team, not by like, oh, in version one, it was gg.com and then in version two, it was great. Like that's not how you judge, don't do it. Um, and I would implore you to track the evolutions. If you are like me and have notes like that, trash, if you have trash notes, have a separate piece of paper that goes this thing this premise, this is the logic, and then track where it evolves and changes. Like I have separate notes to track evolutions. Um, you can do that. The second thing is just realize as you are judging what things are based on. Like so many arguments are either asserted or not based on any like logical premises that exist. And sometimes teams will spend very little time on a premise, a lot of times, a lot of time spent explaining the outcomes of that premise. And sometimes you will realize that it is just true that people have to rebut that one line of premise and that argument loses its validity, validity because it doesn't have the consequences. So check what argue, what is contingent on what and how much that impacts the debate and like the flow on benefits. Cause you know, people can claim to solve racism. If you don't have the mechanisms or the logic for it, you don't get the thing you are saying, not winning the debate. And the last thing I think you should track uh, incentives of actors. Like most debates will have actors and concerns that they have. Obviously people will dispute what those incentives are, how much those incentives weigh against each other. You should consistently be checking against those things because it could well, very well be the case that people can prove X incentive, but uh, X actor will benefit more from an outcome. But if the incentive of that actor is more non-utility utile, for example, perhaps there are other concerns you should care about. So just keep in mind those things. Um, and the last thing, and I think this is important in BP most particularly, is weighing and prioritizations. Most of the time, teams will, most of the times if you're lucky, let me just caveat that, teams will tell you why you should care about arguments and why you should care about those arguments and concerns over other concerns in the debate. Yeah, and it's your job to track what like that way whether or not that weighing is like sufficient enough for you to prioritize specific arguments over each other there are contexts in which teams have no weighing and a whole bunch of substantive material that gets unlike not compared against each other and just directly rebutted you can do things like directly rebut 
um, you know, directly figure out where, which will battle these each other. And when you're comparing against arguments, you would look at things like how much um, like legwork is done in the argument to prove it is true, how much of the impact is extrapolated to things like the like quantity of harm, the group that we care about that is a minority. So there are many ways to like prioritize arguments, even if there is no explicit weighing. Sometimes there is a lot of weighing, but no substantive argument. Then you should ask yourself, are people weighing like abstract things that are not actually sub like stuff they've proven? Like you can weigh stuff, but if you haven't proven the thing is going to happen or likely to happen or principally sound, then you're weighing like something you don't have. So like there's no hard and fast answer to it is my takeaway from this. But when you're considering this, you really want to think about whether or not you are overly prioritizing one over the other inherently, or if you're following the flow of the debate, there are specific considerations um, that are always, always going to be unique to that debate. Cool. Direct clashes. So this is just like in terms of like, like opening house, for example, or like closing half where they're directly engaging with each other's material. The key things you want to look at when you're making direct com comparisons is to ask yourself a couple of these things that I've written down here. I mean, obviously this list is not like non -ex like non exhaustive just go to town if you think there are other concerns but <clears throat> When you are judging the comparisons in teams, you want to look specifically for disagreements on, for example, like most times people will just disagree by saying things are not true or like this particular thing is not like as, com like as solid of a logic compared to this argument. Sometimes teams will say that thing is true, but you care about X thing more in this world. Or sometimes they will say that thing is true, but the impacts aren't so bad. Here are reasons why those impacts are not so bad. So there are many ways to defeat an argument. You just have to be aware that it's not it, it, it is like it is a, obviously a strategic tool that teams can pick for which kind of strategy they want to use. But you just have to weigh how effective the strategy is in beating that argument, um, for example. And the second thing you want to note is like, obviously, I think teams have impacts in the debate. And for principle, it is like the principle backing of a debate. You want to track whether or not you think those impacts are like, like, have they weighed up those impacts? Do you think that, um, what do you call this? Do you think that the, the impacting is like, that argument means, if, do you think the impacting is such that the argument gets so much more weight in the, in the debate because it has impacts that the team has explained to be broad or like, like cause like significant harm to a specific community or like whatever the argument may be, you want to kind of track that as well. And like the most important part, even in direct comparisons is why we ought to care about specific arguments. The example I have here, um, is kind of like yesterday's debate, and I'm gonna assume you all have watched the debate. Um, no, they have. We do not assume that. Okay, I will not assume that. We will go back to normal stuff that is not involved the debate. Um, so, like, I mean, in the hypothetical debate that you all have not watched, it is plausible that teams will make arguments that explain why a specific harm is subsumed by a greater benefit. That is not to directly rebut the harm, but is that is to explain why other benefits come that we should consider above the other things. So the point is just when you are judging direct comp comparisons, I think you have to make it abundantly clear with, to yourself when you're preparing your notes that there are like there's not there's not one way to beat an argument and you should be tracking every single like response teams have and uh, i make side notes on my paper explaining like this doesn't beat the premise or this doesn't prove that a specific harm is outweighed it just provides a comparative like a comparison in terms of harms so have notes in terms of what you think about the particular thing that you're writing down um the last consideration you want to do in direct comparisons is often teams have like in like buffers and exemptions and characterizations and trade-offs in their arguments this obviously like is like a like a, if you're lucky enough to have like a better debate where teams try to do this it's obviously true that sometimes teams can like buffer their arguments with like caveats about when like this principle matters even if there are other considerations or they could do things like suggest that you know there are characterizations on the other side that make their arguments impossible to like take into account therefore my argument is true those are not direct in the sense that obviously they're not like directly rebutting each other they are buffering a specific argument but if you take the argument with its inherent responses in weighing up other teams and i think this like Generally speaking, you should, if you do all of this, you should generally be okay for direct comparisons. Um, I know this is like a little bit technical and like obviously it's like a bit complicated, but with the stuff about tracking debates and the, like this, like consider concerns you would possibly have, um, it makes it a lot easier for you not to like, you know, just do things like list out arguments. A lot of judges list out arguments and then just list other arguments and be like, for those reasons, I thought op was better, which is not judging. You want to make direct comparisons as much as possible.
Cool. Weighing the weighing. So I think this applies to closing teams. It applies to opening teams. It applies to all your judging. Um, and I'm not going to read everything out. You can just read it yourself. But the, the main takeaway in this part of the lecture is obviously to ask yourself if all arguments are made equal. They are obviously not. Some arguments can be. It is very plausible for two arguments to be made with the same depth of logic, with the same weighing for why we should care about each other. And then that's just a matter of you like weighing up the weighing and deciding which one is more like important and plausible. But by and large, there will be differences in teams in terms of whether how well they explain the prioritization of their arguments or the likeliness of their argument being a, like a thing in the debate or how well they explain what they're willing to trade off in the debate and why that means their argument is still worth the pain that it puts into the world. And oftentimes, they obviously don't just dispute what is true in the debate, which is like a primary concern you should have. There is a set, like a, obviously like a meta disagreement on what is the thing we should care about as hum human beings or judges in the debate. Um, you want to make sure that you are separating the two because it is like, don't, like I would re highly not recommend you muddling up what teams think are relevant and good to the debate with what is true and like disagreements on the internal mechanics. Like obviously they play a part in each other when you are deciding them, but just to make sure that you are clear um, that the two are separated um, will help you in terms of clarity when you're judging. So teams don't think you are unfairly like privileging weighing over like constructive matter. You haven't taken into account the fact that the weighing comes with less matter. For example, don't get accused of that. Um, it's not a happy side. Um, where there is nothing and you're just like, they're all the teams have just like not weighed anything. You just obviously default to the average intelligent voter and the, like the, uh, like for example, the ability to comprehend like logic and like which logic sounds more like, it has more of like step throughs of why it's more important or like the rigor of that logic. Those are the things you would default to. Um, and that's just the average intelligent voter. That is not to say you can make, I've heard like, Great judges apparently be being just like it is my intuition that X thing is good. That is not that is not the standard for anything. Um, the standard is an average intelligent voter and what they are like intuitions when provided with facts and willing to be cons like swayed from one opinion to another. What that person would do, not what Amri Agastya randomly in Canberra has decided what I feel is correct. You know that's not it. Don't do it. Cool. That's weighing the weighing. Good back half and judging diagonal. So. I know everybody tells you all this all the time every day, which is just everything is an extension. Unless someone puts on the speaker and like repeats prime minister word for word, it is an extension because you are rearranging words in different ways. And that means different things because language. Yeah, yeah, they are right. Obviously, like by and large, everything people say is like relatively new or tries to be new. The point of the debate is when you are judging is to consistently ask yourself if it is true that you think the extension is meaningfully better than what came before. Now, the question every, every judge will have, and that's the problem that people have is, what is meaningfully new? How do we know what is meaningfully better? The question is just, first you ask yourself, to what degree um, specific arguments or lines of logic have been made in the opening half that you are persuaded by? Ask yourself if the additional stuff has made you more persuaded and if that increase in persuasion has, like, like meaningfully change the understanding of that argument, the appreciation of that argument, whether or not that argument had already hit a significant threshold and you were just like slightly more persuaded. Obviously in the latter, that just, I don't think adds a, like a meaningful extension, but if it changes your understanding of the argument and changes the way the logic works and subsequent comparisons, like the test is just like, trust yourself. Like obviously if you are listening to an argument and it sounds like slightly more EPL and like, ooh, fancy, but like it doesn't change the core logic and understanding of the argument or just change it, does change it in like small ways, like maybe in a one or two arguments. Perhaps that isn't, um, that isn't the bar for what is a good extension. But that is also to caution you against having a really high bar, you know, like it is not a very hard to have a winning extension. It is just whether or not it has added a meaningful difference to the debate. Sometimes, um, and this is usually what teams will try to do because it's just, like easier debating is to just like we have a whole new area and like most tournaments hopefully if you're judging bp have like deep motions and teams will just be like yeah seven new extensions i have that are like random thoughts and like in some instances those extensions can be seven weird small qualms it could be like oh yes because of this motion um the bottle industry will be harmed and then subsequently the pen industry and then subsequently the sanitizer industry and you're just like i guess this is new but who cares um, is the test you always ask yourself. And then you compare the weightage of that argument or like those arguments against the stuff in the opening. Um, this is also not to say you should count 
arguments like just because opening has like 16 small things that they want to talk about and closing has like one thing that they've weighed and like explained and like gone through to tower on the argument that's something you should concern yourself with um and it is obviously better uh, as you are judging to be proactive about these comparisons like so when a member is speaking as they're speaking i will look at like the holistic contributions that they have in terms of like when they're responding to opening opposition have they done more responses that are like more comprehensive than opening government are they being the argument in a way that i think is meaningfully different or important to the debate like those kind of things and obviously i think pois are part of this the way a closing team engages with the opening half through a poi obviously can reframe like an ex like an argument that the opening this team is making or posit an inquiry that makes it like like makes you want to question whether or not the stuff in the opening is like properly good so you can take that into account obviously when you're deciding what an extension is and what framing they've put into place um when judging debates cool judging diagonals so um the most important thing that i think people always slip up with is they're just like oh opening government can't respond to closing opposition and closing opposition has this case that you know is like not respond like it doesn't act like it explicitly respond to opening government but it's a whole other consideration and i believe opening government's consideration is really good and they are both great considerations and then you cc the world's finals in thessaloniki and then people disagree for five hours and obviously those are very hard situations where there's no like what like a hard and fast way how to break those deadlocks but just some helpful tips in terms of um how do you decide like whether or like how teams place in the debate is just to look and interpret what has been contributed and to the degree that those things for example if you believe them to be true take away from the things that you believe the other team in the diagonal say to be true and obviously because they can't respond to each other and they don't directly respond i think that like changes the way you like the way you apply things like interpretation and like the way you value the argument in its isolation don't don't be so quick to make the comparisons for teams like if there is no comparison don't make it out of thin air and be like yep so this thing implicitly responds to this thing and this thing is related to this thing and then this thing when you go down you'll find opening government's argument bam they win that's not how it works don't like if it is a tough spot that is not an excuse to make up arguments for the teams and obviously you should consider things like the fact that closing comes after they obviously have the ability to frame stuff and do the, the comparison things like pois and willingness for teams to offer them like i know it is very hard to like objectively in your head quantify the lack of a poi given to another team but if a team is standing up all the time asking a poi you need to ask yourself what part of their case or like like would have like is dealing with this material and what what about this material makes it like so obvious they're not taking a poi from opening government and then kind of ask yourself like opening teams have the benefit of obviously giving their material first and like having the ability not to be like matter grabbed by anyone their arguments by and large should be like pretty like robust or like at least they know that they have to like buffer against closing teams so you should check the, their characterizations and how robust they are in comparison to like the diagonal teams for example um just be very clear not to do things like say oh opening government doesn't respond like they're not their material directly responds to closing yeah yeah okay they don't directly respond but a lot of things will implicitly respond to each other it is a debate it, arguments are meant to be in opposition to other arguments context characterization incentives weighing things will happen in the debate that will allow you room to do it yeah and you're just just to look for those things and find as like the thing that is most important or the many different things that you think are important and explain to teams team teams why they lost on those like comparisons um and i know judging diagnosis is like super complicated because you just like it, it requires a lot of effort and i think a bit of discretion on your part um which are obviously things i would implore you to like take but with caution um that is not to say that you can say stuff like you know both teams couldn't engage with each other and they were both equally good so i let my panel speak you know like just just don't say that that's just weird uh um and i like i really i if it ever happens um i i think is very very rare like i even like in debates where i think that two teams are just like in opposition to each other and like they just don't respond and they're completely against like they don't engage with each other but they are equally good um you can still find a ways to justify things in terms of weighing in terms of like the inherent incentives or like the mechanisms in their argument um so don't be lazy about it is my take away from this okay speaker skill so i mean obviously i'm like i've put up the the scale here from the warsaw scale something that's a scale that they use for words um and you can read it 
So please read it. But the most important thing is to realize that there is quite an expensive scale. So like, look at this, like every two points or five points, there is a difference between what is like a 77, uh, sorry, between what is like a 67 and what is a 70, for example. Um, when you are judging a speaker, don't vibe, like don't go off a of vibe. Don't go like, mm, I guess there's something there. So 77, um, that's not how it goes. You like, I, if you don't have this like manual on you, um, maybe you want to have like a, like a paper, just write down your rough like takeaways from each of these sections, for example. So for example, like a 73 to 75 is just like relevant. Like it, hit, it hits the threshold as a bare minimum that it is relevant. Um, it might miss out on like things that you think are fundamental to the debate. Um, but you know, they're logical, but very simple stuff. Like you like, it's like fine. The point is just when you're looking at the speaker scale, just be very aware that um, your bar shouldn't be too high or too low. Like I know this is like, it might be a function of like racism at worst, or it might be a function of like really bad at judging like the scale or like sexism. I'm not sure, but like there are like a lot of judges who underscore when of like, it is just like, I, like from paneling at worst, it's just or like judging at worst. It is just like, you really want to make sure that when your judges are scoring and you feel like it's unfair or you think that you are being a little bit like under crediting or over crediting a speaker to ask yourself if it really hits this like the standards that are set up by the speaker scale and like i know people don't like bring this around or talk about it but like if you're not sure you just print out this and like have it next to you in the debate like kind of like vibe with what it is which is like no one is going to blame you for it it doesn't make you seem bad like it makes you seem like you actually give a shit about these things which is a good thing um and most importantly you can use the range, like obviously not with like high amounts of discretion being like today, that fella really good, 95, you know, like it's calm down. By and large, people are in the middle sort of with exceptional speeches being on the upper end. But that is not to discourage people from using the scale. So I think there's a difference between allowing discretion and being cautious about it and telling judges, don't ever use this, like how dare you give like an 85, which is like, insane because the scale is there to be used and obviously we trust judges to do it so don't artificiate yourself because the problem the problem with this like telling yourself that you shouldn't be going up or low too much is that you start confining your scale and then you artificially like start giving out like between 74 and 77 your whole life and that's like, very hard to fix once you get into that mindset so if familiarize yourself with the scale um that will help fixing that problem is that all yeah that's all yeah okay how do I stop screen sharing? Sorry, Amrit, um, could you just go back one slide um, yeah. to, the, to the speaks scale? Just one minute. To, um, yeah, yeah, can, can. Just, just wanted to say like one more thing about the speaker scale, which I think Amrit's probably already said, but it's probably worth repeating. Um, if you guys look at the range for 79 to 82, it's actually extremely lenient. Arguments are relevant and address core issues in the debate. Arguments are well made without obvious logical gaps and they are well explained, they may be vulnerable to good responses. So if you look at this, right, um, arguments address the core issues. That's going to be uh, most of the rounds you are going to be seeing because it's very rare where you have a speaker that's making arguments that don't address the core issues at all. Well made without obvious logical gaps. Obviously, there might be still some issues with it here and there, but it doesn't have to be a perfect speech to fit into the 7982 range. I think a lot of beginning judges are a little bit worried about breaking the AT barrier. Um, so it seems like they tend to underscore based on that. They usually just think a speech needs to be very good if it transcends an 80, which is not actually necessarily the case. It can be an 80, even if it is vulnerable to good responses by the other team, can be an 80, even if it could be more relevant or even if it could be stronger or better or more robustly explained. There is no magical like 80 barrier. Um, but at the same time, just like when you're not afraid to go up, you should also not be afraid to go down and give 70s and sub 70s if you need to. The using the range goes both ways. You can't just say I'm going to be a speaks fairy because I'm using the range fairly upwards, but I feel sorry for people, so I'm not going to use it downwards and I'm going to cluster at 73 or 74. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, the next part of this is that we're going to play you one full debate video this is your opportunity to put into application everything that's just been said by Amrit. And then what will happen at the end of the debate is that we will break out into about three groups to 
have further discussions about what we thought about that debate and have any questions. If you have any questions you want to ask, that is the moment to ask it because all of us will be in each breakout room to clarify about the debate and about any of the theories of the judging that you just heard. What we're going to do is I'm going to send you the YouTube link to this video and you can watch it in your own time and then go like mute the zoom and come back in an hour and do the breakout rooms here at the end of that debate happening on YouTube because the YouTube link is a lot clearer um, as well. So give me a sec. Let me get the link. <laughs> 